Good morning, dear friends. It's great to be with you guys on this Wednesday morning. The week is just kind of going by so very quickly this week. So I hope everybody's having a good one, though. I hope everybody's um, found some joy this week. Maybe you've been getting some rest in preparation for the new year. Um, I mean, we're in the new year, I've realized, but there's still um, kind of, you know, not so many cars out on the road, which tells me that there are people who are still on vacation this week. So I don't know if that is you or if you've had to go back to work. Some of you are definitely retired. And um, so this may be just normal time for you, but um, I um, put on this uh, comment on the comments. You'll see one of the very first comments today are the readings. And so Mary, welcome. I see you're on here and you asked for the readings. So you should find those in the comments. You should also find those on uh, the beginning of the post um, if you want to look at that. Um, so, so glad that you can join us. And uh, we have this morning, Janet, Stacy, Jack, uh, Gustina, Joe, Susan, Leslie, Mary. Um, all right. So we're so glad to have you guys and um, we're ready to get started. All right. So we're the first reading that we have is in this book, Lion Bites. We've been reading daily in this. This is by Emma Stark, and we just kind of start off uh, with that. And today's day 57, and it says the mundane is becoming powerful. First Samuel 17, 50 says, so David triumphed over the Philistine, Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. In a, vi in a vision, I watched as outside a blacksmith's workshop, a large line began to form. People from far and wide brought with them seemingly mundane and banal household and banal household objects and equipment into the shop. The blacksmith received them, refashioned them as weapons, and gave them back to the owners. Those items that looked as though they possessed Little or no warfare significance became essential armor and weaponry fit for battle in the hands of the owner. The Lord says, you are equipped already with skills, abilities, and talents in your hands that seem mundane and worthless. Creative art, music, cooking, hospitality, singing, movement building, teaching, researching, writing, and more. They seem insignificant, but in and through my hands, they can become weapons of victorious warfare that become mighty for battle. Cooking skills can carry deliverance as you gather those that need freedom around the kitchen table. Your writing can produce breakthrough in the life of those who read. Art, music, movement, building, and more. All of these things by my spirit can become weapons that enforce my victory on the earth. Do not underestimate what is in your hands. Don't discount what appears mundane. Don't disqualify yourself by assuming that there are no weapons for effective battle. You have what you need. Just surrender it to me and watch as I take the mundane and make it powerful and effective for battle. And here's what we are to receive. As you sit in response to this word, invite the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what is in your hands that he wants to transform into weapons for war. Ask him to show you how to use it for warfare and battle, what it looks like, and how you are to respond. Now, in reading this, um, I think sometimes we may, um, we because we, we have this aversion sometimes to war, or some of us do, um, we look at the violent side of war and all of that, then we may put up this wall and say, well, I don't want any weapons of war. I want to be uh, instruments of peace. Well, what this battle is, is it's a spiritual battle. And whether we want to admit it or not, we are fighting a spiritual battle because we are, we are in a world where, um, the, the, the spirit is laid upon the natural. And, um, we are natural beings, but we are fighting a spiritual battle. And I think all of us, um, know this. We fight. We fight the enemy when it comes to our tongues, when we say things and, 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 and in our actions, when we do things, 
that we know are not pleasing to the Lord and we don't want to do them. It's like the Apostle Paul said, you know, I do the things I don't want to do and the things I don't want to do are the very things that I do. We have that same battle going on. And so um, we it's it's a spiritual battle. And so when it's talking about these these uh these uh, weapons of war, that's the war that we're talking about fighting. And that's an important war to fight. And we also, you know, right now, I, um, I know very, very well this battle for our children, our grandchildren, um, the, the battle for our brothers and sisters in Christ who have walked out the door of the church for one reason or another, maybe because they've been hurt by something in the church or someone or somebody has, you know, we all have those, those, uh, spiritual defects, those shortcomings, uh, character defects. And, um, people look at that and they go, well, they're just hypocritical as if they have the expectation walking in the door that if you're a Christian, you're supposed to somehow be perfect. Well, that's not what we are, right? We're imperfect beings, but we're, it's like coming to a hospital. The hospital is there for the sick people. The church is here for the people who understand that they are, that they need help, that they need the Holy Spirit to help. So God gives us all of these warfare weapons um, to fight these spiritual battles and to be part of a solution and to use those the creativity, to use the skills that he has given us for the sake of fighting that battle. And to ever think that we don't have anything to offer or we're not good enough or we're not smart enough or we're not knowledgeable enough, that's the words of the enemy going into our head that's convincing us to to not use those weapons that we have at access to that really will make a difference in the kingdom of God. So I just want to encourage you this morning. Just encourage you to find those gifts. And just like it said here in the action that we're to take today is maybe we ask the Holy Spirit to show us what it is that we can use to be a positive influence in this world, to write something that somebody's going to read that's going to make a difference or to um, do a piece of art that is absolutely going to cause somebody to stop and take note and where you can have little subtle symbols of the faith in there that people see. Um, but it's not just so obvious unless you get in and look at it. Um, there's all sorts of, of ways we can be used. Um, you know, a sort of a pastoral care or lay person's care, grief ministry. I think about uh, Leslie on here um, and Christy that have been trained as Stephen ministers and they have so much to offer um, in regard to people who are hurting, people that are going through very difficult times. Um, those are a gift in the church, uh, folks that have that training because they can they can really help. So be encouraged today, my friends, and know that you are very valuable in the kingdom of God and God has equipped you whether you recognize it or not. Oh Lord, let our souls rise up to meet you just as the day rises to meet the sun. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen and amen. Today we're reading Psalm 145. Starting in verse one, it says, I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is the most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue, and I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom and they will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. 
You rule throughout all generations. The Lord always keeps his promises. He is gracious in all that he does. The Lord helps the fallen and lifts those bent beneath their loads. The eyes of all who look to you in hope, you give them food, you give them their food as they need it. And when you satisfy, when you open your hand, you satisfy the hungry and thirst of every living creature. The Lord is righteous in everything he does. He is filled with kindness. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who calls on him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear him. He hears their faithful cries for help and rescues them. The Lord protects all those who love him, but he destroys the wicked. I will praise the Lord and may everyone on earth bless his holy name forever and ever. So in this passage, we uh, see the author, David, he's the psalmist, and we see this hymn of praise that he is lifting up and he is just telling about God's goodness. Um, and he is, he's talking about, um, the the full love of God that absolutely satisfies us in every way possible. When we start to hunger for something, he's the one that will actually um, quench that hunger or quench that thirst um, because he is he is the full diet that we need. We may search for things in the world um, in an attempt to, to fill that spot that only he can fill, but we'll always be left hungry will always be left thirsty. We will never be satisfied. Only the Lord can satisfy those needs. He talks about how merciful and compassionate and how full of love God is. And it's just this beautiful, beautiful picture of God. And you know, there are, there are, uh, different ways of viewing God. Some people choose to view God as that judgmental, um, gonna get you kind of God. But there, there are passages in scripture that tell us of God's love, even in the discipline, even in those times when he convicts us, when he shows us the things that are wrong. That's an ultimate picture of love. Because he knows that unless he does that, unless he corrects us, then we're going to continue down a path that's going to be destructive and that's going to lead to our death and it's going to lead to our misery. And he doesn't want that. So he loves us enough to show us the right way and to love us. And so when we, when we see the, these words, we can, we can, um, understand that more completely. I think when we take into consideration that even in the in the times when when he is correcting us that it is because he loves us and then it feels better right all right so uh we are going to move on to leviticus and i know yesterday um i i just it, maybe it's just me maybe y'all are going woohoo can't wait to read leviticus but i know for me it's kind of one of the ones that i've kind of dreaded but We are going to go through the whole Bible and everything has value. There's a reason why it's all here. And so when we start Leviticus here in just a moment, we are picking up at the end of Exodus where um, the uh, Israelites are standing at the foot of Mount Sinai. The tabernacle has been completed. And so they are gathered together in this place to worship. It's in the tent of meeting. And um, the tent of meeting is there. The there were layers inside the tabernacle. So there was the the tabernacle, and there was the first area where there were the sacrifices that were made. Then there was the tent of meeting, which was the worship space. And then in in uh, side of that tent of meeting, then there was um, the the most holy place. And this is where the ark of covenant sat. This is wh- what this this was the seat of God. And and not everyone was permitted behind that curtain. When Jesus died, um, then that that curtain was ripped because when Jesus died, he paid the ultimate price and no more was there this separation between us and God as we see here. So we are picking up in this place where uh, the people have come to worship. So let's let's listen to this. The Lord, this is chapter one, verse one. The Lord called to Moses from the tabernacle and he said to him, 
Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you present an animal as an offering to the Lord, you may take it from your herd of cattle or your flock of sheep and goats. If the animal you present as a burnt offering is from a herd, it must be male with no defects. Bring it to the entrance of the tabernacle so that you may be accepted by the Lord. Lay your hand on the animal's head and the Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you, making you right with him. Then slaughter the young bull in the Lord's presence and Aaron's sons, the priests, will present the animal's blood by splattering it against all sides of the altar that stands at the entrance to the tabernacle. Then skin the animal and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, will build a wood fire on the altar and they will arrange the pieces of the offering, including the head and fat on the wood burning of the, on the altar. But the internal organs and the legs must first be washed with water. Then the priest will burn the entire sacrifice on the altar as a burnt offering. It's a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If the animals you present as a burnt offering is from your flock, it may be either a sheep or a goat, but it may it must be male with no defects. Slaughter the animal on the north side of the altar in the Lord's presence, and Aaron's sons, the priests, will splatter its blood against all sides of the altar. Then cut the animals in pieces, and the priests will arrange the pieces of the offering, including the head and fat, on a wood burning on the wood burning on the altar. But the internal organs and the legs must first be washed with water. Then the priest will burn the entire sacrifice on the altar as a burnt offering. It's a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If you present a bird as a burnt offering to the Lord, choose either a turtle dove or a young pigeon. The priest will take the bird to the altar, wring off its head, and burn it on the altar. But first he must drain its blood against the side of the altar. The priest must also remove the crop and the feathers and throw them in the ashes on the east side of the altar. Then grasping the bird by its wings, the, bir- the priest will tear the bird open, but without tearing it apart. Then he will burn it on the offering of the wood burning on the altar. It's a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Now, one of the reasons why sometimes it's really hard to read Leviticus is because this is gross. I'll just say it. It's just gross. Or at least it is to me. Maybe not to somebody who's a hunter, somebody who's who who has a different perspective on animals. Animals to me are pets. And so I'm just not a farm girl. And so um, so I have a little, you know, I read this and I go, oh, gross. And why? Um, but there is a purpose for this. And it's funny because we were just having a conversation in our uh, study group last night about this. And why was this even necessary? But um, there were there were some things that this sort of um, sacrifice was to teach the people. And when you look at what is what is required, it always says that it's supposed to be kind of the best of the herd. It can be a goat. It can be um, a uh, her. It can be part of the cattle, um, but it's got to be something that's perfect, that's unblemished, that is that is, um, you know, a very it's like the choice part of the herd. Now, what this teaches is that our worship um, requires something of us. And I think we have lost sight of this because all that our worship today requires of us is that we get up out of the bed on Sunday morning and we show up for church. And it's not about that at all. I mean, that's great. That's what we do. That's where we're supposed to be. And hopefully when we get here, we feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. But the, this required a sacrifice. And so what these sacrifices teaches the people, first of all, by requiring perfect animals and holy priests, they taught the reverence of the holy God. That's what that first lesson was. It taught that God is to be revered, that he is special, that he is worthy of our worship. The second thing, by demanding exact obedience, and, and you saw how detailed this was. Th- this is how you do this, that like, you know, this is how it's supposed to happen. You're supposed to throw the feathers of the bird into onto the east side of the fire. You know, you it's very detailed, very, very exact. 
By demanding exact obedience, they taught total submission to God's laws. Now, what we'll get into later is that this is really an impossibility for us, right? To follow all of the laws that they had is an impossibility. And that's why we need Jesus. That's why we need grace. That's why grace and mercy are such a valuable gift. By requiring an animal of great value that showed the high cost of sin and it demonstrated the sincerity of people's commitment to God. It is sometimes hard for us to give our very best. It's hard for us, for example, to tithe because, you know, we're giving a portion, (coughs) excuse me, off of the top of our, um, of what we have. Oh, my allergies this time of year. Um, so we're giving a portion off of the top of what we have. And yet sometimes we don't do that because we say, well, you know, I'm on a fixed income. I can't do that. As if God can't provide for us effectively we've got to or our pension has to or the government has to or whatever i'm telling you i have been tithing for a long long time i did it when our children were young paul and i have always been committed to that and there were some times when i didn't know what was going to happen and so, and god would always provide always provide. There would be somebody that would send a gift in the mail. My grandmother would send a gift in the mail of of some money or my, uh, you know, I would get a, a refund from something I didn't even know I had. God is a provider. And so this was, this was them bringing their very best to the altar of the Lord. Do we bring our very best to the altar of the Lord? When we talk about gifts, when we talk about the talents that we have, do we bring our very best? When we serve on a committee in the church, do we bring our very best to the Lord? Or does he get the leftovers? Because even though this is maybe not our practice today, there's a lot for us to learn here. So, and yes, Leslie, God, uh, we don't worship God halfway, do we? We worship him with our whole heart. And um, and so, uh, you know, it's just really important to remember that when we go about anything that we do. And that's easy to do, to give him our best when God's our priority. When he's not our priority, he gets the leftovers and it's very noticeable. All right, so let's go over to Luke, and we have a very short passage. Hmm. This is Luke chapter 4, verses 42 through 44. Early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. The crowd searched everywhere for him when they finally found him. They begged him not to leave them. But he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. And he continued to travel around preaching in synagogues throughout Judea. All right, so a couple of things. The first thing that we notice is he got up very early in the morning and he went to an isolated place to pray. This was hit, this was this picture of what what we all can can benefit from is when we get up early and we start the the day with the Lord in prayer and in Bible study, then it makes a tremendous difference in our day and how we go about. That's why we do praise in the morning is so that we can all get together. And before work starts, um, we can we can spend some time in the word of God. So Jesus models that for us. The second thing that he says in here is the people really wanted him to stay right there with them. And they just wanted to continue to benefit from his ministry, from the words that he was saying, from the healing that he was doing. Um, They just wanted to be in his presence. But he said, I have to go from here because I've got other tasks that I have to do. And so he had to leave them. And he, and there were some that followed him, that just followed him around. Um, 
And so for us, what we take away from this is a couple of things. One is, do we have that sort of love for Jesus where we can't wait for more more time with the Lord? Like we can't wait for our morning meditation. We can't wait for, for that quiet time when we go for a walk later in the day where it's just us and God, or we sit down and we have a time of meditation. I can't wait for that time with the Lord. I love that time and there's not ever enough time. So I get what these people felt in that sense. And I bet you do too. Um, The other thing is he knew what his task was. And this was really important because you and I know what our task is too. We've been told in Matthew 28, we're to go out and we're to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That does not mean that we we hold ourselves up into our homes and we do our thing. COVID and the, the uh, isolation that we've experienced over the last almost three years has promoted that. And it's really a, a tool of the enemy in my book because I heard it statistics the other day that said 45% of people who used to go to church no longer do anymore after COVID. Let's let that sink in for a moment. That is crazy. So we've got things to do. And what Jesus models here is I, I have things to go. I'm not, I can't stay here. I can't isolate here as much as maybe I'd like to. I can't do it. I've got, I've got a message to lead, to, to leave the world. And as his people, the body of Christ filled with his spirit, we have that very same mission. We can't just isolate. We can't be afraid. We can't live in fear of COVID or anything else. We have to get out there and we have to do. So I want to encourage you with that. And let's follow Christ's model today. All right. I'm always like talking too much. And uh, we and then we get to our prayer time and I feel like I have to hurry. So um, I'm going to I'm going to say our prayer in just a moment. But just to give you um, a few little things, uh, we want to pray today for our homebound. We have Anita Chaplin, Virgil and Meadows, Bernadette, who's Peggy's mom. Ray Henderson, um, who is Mary Chaplin's um, brother, and um, Charlotte's father, uh, Charlotte Totch's father. Um, these are all folks that are homebound, and then they're caregivers. Um, Doug Chaplin, Mary Chaplin, Bob Meadows, Peggy Rowland, Gary, and Charlotte Totch. So, and then those of you and more, I know that there are others um, that are there, and we are praying for your homebound as well. Um, then there are those with cancer and we have quite a list of those. We have Pastor Harold, Mary Kay Crowder, Phyllis Green, Ron Taylor, John Wyatt, Laura Hernandez, Lily, Emma, and Jay, um, who had, who's the cousin of Michael Hill. He was a new addition. And then, um, we want to, we want to continue to pray for those who are going through various transitions, grief, life circumstances, engagements, uh, moving job situations. Um, so these are Todd Jones, Michael Hill, Rose Turner, Randy Loving, Polly Murphy, Mariah uh, Paco, and jo- and uh, Joe Loy. And then um, those who are ill, um, Polly and Steve Murphy, um, Camilla, who is the house manager of Open Arms Sober Living, have COVID. And uh, Carl Ammon, I still continue to pray for him, even though he said we could take him off the prayer list. But I still pray for him because, I, you know, I want him to be strong and healthy. And um, he's been on the mend and he, he is a strong and determined man. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we praise you and we thank you this day for all of your goodness. We thank you for these lessons that you've taught us. May we today give you our very best. You are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our praise. And so today, Lord, we give you our best. Help us to not walk in fear, to not walk in a spirit of scarcity, thinking that we have to provide for ourselves. Yes, we have to be wise. Yes, we have to be good stewards. But in the end, you're the one that's going to provide. And in those times when we may not see a way, You always provide a way. You've been so faithful to do that. David in the Psalms just continued to proclaim your name because he had found that to be true. And we all find that to be true. 
So today, Father, I pray that you will help us to give you our very best knowing that you are taking care of us while we are doing the things that you have called us to do as we are being obedient. Father, we thank you that you are a healing God, that you are a God who provides uh, relief and peace in the midst of transitions. You are a God that pours your joy and your love over us at all moments. And so we pray for all of those that we have lifted up by name. One name um, I want to lift up as, as um, a very serious health condition, be having surgery on Monday, is... Um, is um, um, I've lost her name. The, the one and more that's Michelle's daughter. I had her name just a moment ago, but Father, I pray that you will just be with her, that you will um, give her a sense of peace and give Michelle that sense of peace. And I pray, Lord, that you will work out that health situation um, as as you see fit that your hands of protection and healing will be upon her. And Father, we just praise you and we thank you for the ways in which we see you in the world around us, in the colors of a sunset and a sunrise, in the the people that we we encounter each day, and especially as we look to your word and we feel your presence in prayer. Hear us now, O Lord, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The name that I couldn't remember was Lindsay Bauckham, and it just left my brain, but God knows. All right. God, your word instructs us to be ready to give an answer for the faith that is within us. When the, when that time comes, Lord, make us bold to proclaim that your love surpasses human knowledge. Let our answer be actions that mirror your love. Amen. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may lead you today. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storms. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he will show you. May he bring you home rejoicing right back here on Friday morning. Until then, everyone, have a great couple of days and I'll see you Friday. Take care.